Good evening. Good to see you tonight. We welcome you to the service and uh, trust you've had a good day. I'd like to welcome all of those who are watching tonight at home and uh, welcome you as well. And I uh, trust you we're going to have a good time. We uh, appreciate Brian leading us today. John Clendenning is out of town, uh, back up in toward God's country, up toward Blue Mountain, back up that way, visiting with his uh, grandkids. And uh, I think tomorrow is his, like, 59th birthday. Don't tell him I said that. But uh, still in the 50s, I guess that's a good thing coming from somebody who's in the 60s, but uh, think about him, and uh, we're glad Brian came and, and shared with us today. I um, want to remind you to be praying for those uh, with the water problems in uh, Jackson and uh, Richland. That's going to be coming on down that way. Uh, we saw some houses under the water today and cars under the water, and uh, those are just across the edge of uh, Jackson from us so it's coming this way and uh, disaster relief is going to be setting up round about so everybody that's a part of that you be sure to keep your pagers on and your ears attuned and maybe some other things that uh, we might can even do and uh, the aid of that so pray for them and uh, again, thank you to everybody who worked so hard this weekend, this past week. Uh, Y'all really have done a lot of work. And uh, thank you to our speaker this morning at breakfast. It was great, uh, Brother Failer. He is uh, a great nephew to Brother M.L. Failer that uh, visits with us from time to time. So got a lot of good Failer pastors around. And uh, if you didn't get to come, you missed out this morning. And then I had guests here this afternoon for training from the Baptist building. Uh, so there are all kinds of meetings that are going on all the time, and you've got the opportunity to hear some really good people speak. I want to encourage you to take advantage of those things. But tonight we're going to worship, and we invite you to, to sing with us and to praise the Lord. And Brian's going to come and lead us again. And uh, before he comes, let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for loving us and caring for us. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place to worship. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would come and fill us, that we might know how to worship and how to do it in such a way that we would be well-pleasing to you. And Father, direct our minds, our hearts, and our spirits, that we might worship you in truth, that we might worship you according to the Spirit and his leadership. And help us just to serve and worship you throughout the week uh, by way of service and obedience. Uh, thank you again for Jesus and for who he is and what he does. And we pray it in his mighty name. Amen. Good evening. It's good to see y'all here tonight. Thank you for the words of encouragement throughout the day. They've meant a lot to me. Well, let's sing. Let's stand if you're able. Open up the heavens. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name. Part of 
mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our prayer. Show us, show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us. Show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our
I sensed his presence, and I knew this was the place where love abounds. For this is the temple, Jehovah God abides here. standing in his presence on holy ground. We are standing on holy ground. And I Let's stand again as we continue to sing. This is amazing grace. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth? With holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in all its wonder, the King of glory, 
the king above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that he would take my place, that he would bear I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules a nation with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings amazing this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my I sing for all that you've done for me. You stood before creation, eternity. spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my failure and carried the cross for my shame. My sin weighed upon your shoulders, my soul now heart, oh God, completely to you. I walk upon salvation, your spirit alive in me, my life to declare your promise, my soul now. So what can I say, and what can I do, but all 
Father God, thank you for the day. Uh, Father, I thank you for a time that we can gather and uh, as iron sharpens iron. Uh, Father, that we can corporately sing your praises. Um, and Father, just lift our voices high. Because um, Father, we're told if, if we don't cry out to you and we don't sing praises to you and we don't worship your name, Father, you'll call the rocks uh, to cry out. Uh, Lord God, I just I pray for, for Brother Mile. Uh, I pray that he can bring us your word. Um, Father, that, that you have placed on his heart that we need to hear in this very moment. Uh, Father, I just thank you for his boldness. Uh, Father, I know this, this month has been uh, difficult um, in a lot of aspects on, on his sermons and Father, what a blessing they are to me, and they have been for me. Um, Father, just thank you for all that you do for us. We pray these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to John. John chapter 1, verse 1. And we'll read again John chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 14. And and we're going to think about who Jesus is in this sense, that Jesus Christ is Son of God, and Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. And it is not as simple as just talking about the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, and we'll try to point that out to you tonight. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now the thing I want to key off of tonight is that He is, according to verse 14, the only begotten of the Father. The only begotten of the Father. And so the first thing we have to think about tonight is sonship. And what does that mean? We're going to talk about son of, son of, son of, over and over and over tonight. And um, we want to really know what in the world does it mean to be uh, a son in the first place. And uh, that just simply refers to that relationship that Jesus Christ has the Son has with the Father, and He is using that as an illustration to show us of the uniqueness 
of that relationship, that special relationship that is there. And he describes it for us in several different ways and in several different places. I read in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1 that God at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days has spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the worlds who being the brightness of his glory whose glory God's glory being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so God is telling us in the book of Hebrews that God has spoken to us in a lot of different ways, but the greatest way that he has ever spoken to us is by sending his son. And what does it mean for him to be his son? He is, first of all, the brightness of his glory. Now, the lights are burning here tonight, and some are bright and some are dim. But all of those have some kind of a glorious aura about them. And what we can see in those lights is that express brightness of electricity. Jesus is the express brightness of the glory of, G of, of God the Father. Not only that, it says that he is the express image of his person. Boy, he, he looks like the Father. Now, the Father has no body. The Father is a spirit. The Father no man has ever seen with his own human eyes and lived to tell about it. But those who saw Jesus Christ saw the Son. And Jesus said, when you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. Because if you look at me and you see who I am, Jesus said, you can look at the Father and know who he is. And that's what Hebrews tells us here, that he is the express image of the person of God. He expresses something, and he is the image of something. And that is the person of God the Father. The same thing is said back over in the book of, of Romans. In Romans um, chapter 1, uh, I think the same guys probably wrote this. Hebrews and Romans. But the idea is found in Romans chapter 1 and verse 2 that God promised before his through his prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Yet another passage that tells us that Jesus Christ is Son. He is the Son of God in both of those places. But we're going to see that He is much more than that. That He is Son of David. He is the Son of David. If you were to read through the Scriptures and start picking on your fingers and counting out how many times you might see it, as you look for this phrase, the Son of David, in the New Testament, there are 17 verses that you could come across that declare that Jesus Christ is the son of David. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Well, I'd have to tell you that that's a messianic title, the son of David. Do you remember when Jesus was coming into uh, uh, Jerusalem and, and this big procession and people were out there singing and putting palm branches down? They said, uh, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And and they began to call on the son of David. And, and you think about blind people who were are sitting uh, to the side of the road and they would hear that Jesus was coming and they'd cry out and they'd ask him to help them. And what they would cry out is, son of David, have mercy on me. Why did they call him son of David? Well, it is that messianic title. It lets us know that he is the Messiah that was long expected. 
And it is found from the Old Testament places that uh, remind us that Jesus indeed was coming and that he is the Messiah. But it also tells us all the way through Scripture that he is um, in the line of David. I go back over to, to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 41, and I remind you that Jesus used this very title to confound Pharisees and people who were rubbing him wrong in that day. And there were a lot of people that just rubbed Jesus wrong. He just got upset with people. He got angry with people. And he let them know it. Called them names. Ugly names. Jesus did that? He did. That's no license for you to do that. Because you're not Jesus. But he's God. He can do what he wants to do. And he did. But one of the things that he used in order to, to egg these guys on is found in Matthew chapter 22. And these were Pharisees. And while the Pharisees were gathered together in verse 41, Jesus asked them, saying, What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? Now that's a question that Jesus asked the Pharisees. That is a question Jesus asked religious leaders of that day. Now, if Jesus is going to use that as something to, to reveal their ignorance, and he did, if he's going to ask that question to uh, give himself opportunity to shine, and he did, if he's going to give uh, that kind of a question and tell uh, Matthew to record that for us, I just have to assume that that was an important statement that Jesus made. And Jesus wants to know from those people, and he probably wants to know from us today, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And that's kind of what this whole message is about tonight, the sonship of Jesus. And in particular, he's going to talk about the son of David because they said to him, the son of David. And he said to them, well, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying... The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstools. If David then calls the Messiah Lord, how is he his son? <laughs> and nobody was able to answer him a word. Nor from that day on did anyone dare ask him any other questions either. But Jesus is showing us uh, this is an important idea. Whose son is he? And so here he introduces us to the fact that he is David's son, the son of David. And, and we would just tell you that that's a messianic prophecy. And when Jesus showed up and, and was proclaimed to be son of David, it was the proclamation that he was the long-awaited Messiah. And so it was the fulfillment of prophecy but thirdly, let me tell you, there are a couple of other things in Scripture you'd want to know about. Son of David is probably one of those minor phrases that was used to describe him and, and title him. You, you have to think about him being the Son of God as well. Son of God. And, and we need to get real comfortable with that one because if you were to uh, look through your New Testament, thank goodness for computers, right? Right? And you do a phrase search and you look for son of God. Man, it pops up in just the New Testament 46 times. Must be a pretty important phrase, huh? And it is yet a title as well, son of God. And, and I remind you what is said in the book of John chapter 3 and verse 16. Just a few pages on over from where we began in John chapter 1. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Only begotten Son. Now, when you're reading there in John chapter 3 and verse 16, there is a particular word that is used and translated only begotten. It's a compound word. It's monogenes. Mono means one. 
only, unique. And then genes means generation. It's translated begotten for us. So he is the only one who has been begotten of the Father as Son. I think you really, 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 really need to remember that. And you need to know and understand that so that you don't translate some other scriptures in the wrong way. If you go back over there to John chapter 26. In John chapter 26 and, and verse 63, 64. <laughs> Not John 26. There ain't no John 26. Got a different Bible. Is that what he said? Not. <laughs> when, when you go over to, uh, uh, it must be Matthew 26 that I'm looking for. Because there ain't no John 26. <laughs> In John 26, <laughs> Matthew 26, I keep saying John. <laughs> Maybe that's why I'm confused. I keep saying John and I'm thinking John, but I want to say Matthew 26 and verse uh, 63. Jesus is speaking. Jesus kept silent. High priest answers and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Of God. And Jesus said to him, It is as you said. Now, there are people who say that Jesus never claimed to be the Son of God, and yet you have it right here in the red letter stuff. He says, It is as you have said. What has he said? Are you the Christ? Are you the Son of God? And he says, Yes, he is. And he says, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look now, you've heard this blasphemy. And, and they felt that it was blasphemy because he was claiming to be the Son of God, making himself equal with God, making himself be really God come in the flesh. But then we go back to John chapter 1 and verse 14, and it does say there that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so He is the Son of God who dwells with us. Now, i got to tell you, He is unique in kind. When you read Monogene and you read that He is the Son of God in both of those passages, both Matthew and John's, you got to realize that that means he is unique and a one of a kind. The children of God. And people mistakenly think that we've been begotten just like Jesus was begotten, and we are not. There are these preachers on TV, preachers that write books, and they say, they take off on what something C.S. Lewis said one time. C.S. Lewis, great author of days gone by, Christian author, wrote Mere Christianity and things like that. But C.S. Lewis said something like, a being begets a like being. Dogs have baby dogs. Cats have baby cats. We call them pups or kittens, right? But they're baby. People have baby people. And God who begets has a God for son. Now, don't ever think that you've been begotten the way that Jesus has been begotten because you haven't. He is the only one of his kind. you got to remember, you are a creature, and you will always be a creature. You never get to be 
God. That's blasphemy. Because Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, and you are not. And so there are lots of these preachers who say, oh, God begot you, and so God begets gods. Uh, that Asian guy that's on with the poofy haircut. I don't remember his name, but y'all know who he is because y'all watch him, right? Y'all are chuckling. He's one of those guys that gets it wrong. A lot of them get it wrong. Now, that is historic Orthodox Christianity. We do not become gods. We don't become angels either, by the way. When you die and you go to heaven, who wants to be an angel? I don't want to be no angel, man. I want to be bigger than that. Better than that, superior to the angels, and we will judge angels. Why? Because we are creatures created by God, and we will always, forever and a, we will always be creatures created by the Creator. And you're not changed into angels. You're showing your ignorance when you do that, by the way. So quit putting that on Facebook. It's crazy. You get better stuff than what the angels get. And you get to be son. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But you're not a begotten child of God. He is the only begotten child, son of God. Now, secondly, this verse that we just read, and, and let me say it right, in Matthew 26, in verse 63 we were reading, the high priest answered said, I put you under oath, are you the Son of God? Jesus said, yes, it is as you say. So he claims to be the Son of God, but then he says, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power. So not only is he son of God, he is son of man. And this is the favorite phrase that Jesus uses for himself. When he's talking about himself, he usually refers to himself not as son of God, because that'll get you killed. Y'all know he's in Matthew chapter 26 when we see that. He's getting ready to die. And so when he finally says, yeah, I'm son of God, they say, well, you did. We're getting rid of you. And it happens. But for all of his ministry, when he would refer to himself, he would call himself son of man. Son of man. As a matter of fact, son of man. If you do a, a phrase search in your New Testament for son of man, it comes up 82 times just in the Gospels. Just in the Gospels, 82 times. So you can see that that phrase is used far more than son of God is, and that's a big phrase. It is a personal title that was preferred for himself by Jesus. And wonder where in the world does it come from? Well, some people like to go back over to the book of Ezekiel. And they like to read Ezekiel, and there's something like 90 times over there. God speaks to Ezekiel and he calls him son of man. Well, when that's going on, God is just saying, you're just a man. There are never capital letters on that stuff or anything. He's just saying, hey, son of man, let me tell you this. Let me tell you that. And so you see that phrase a lot. But you see that phrase as a messianic phrase in the book of Daniel. If you were to take your Bible and read in the book of Daniel in chapter 7, verse 13 to 14 says this, I was watching in the night visions. Who was? Daniel was watching in the night visions. And behold, one like the Son of Man. And our editors in my copy have rightly capitalized Son and Man. Coming when, with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the ancient of days. And they brought him near before him. Then to him, who? One like the Son of Man. To him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Now, when we're reading in the New Testament, we're looking for a kingdom that is everlasting and shall not be destroyed. Whose kingdom is that? God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. And who is the king who is going to be there as king of the kingdom but Jesus? And so this is a messianic prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, that's talking about the coming Messiah who will be set up as everlasting king. And we get in the New Testament and we're reading and we realize that's Jesus. And what is the title used here in Daniel? Son of Man. And so Jesus picks that up. And he's speaking to to Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes and all of these learned people who've been reading the Word all their lives and people who've been reading Daniel and are familiar with it. And if they just sent out their antenna, they just listened more carefully, they would have known Jesus was claiming for himself to be the Messiah from that one phrase. And he used it over and over and over and over for himself. So it's son of man. That's why it's his favorite phrase. And then he reveals farther that he is son of God when it comes time for him to die because (laughs) that was the killing point for everybody. Now there's one other thing that I want to remind you about as we're talking about sonship. Jesus is absolutely son of David. Jesus is absolutely the son of God. And Jesus is messianically speaking son of man but what about you and me i've already reminded you that the scriptures tell us to as many as receive him to them he gives the power or authority to become the children of god you remember that he gives us the power to become the children of God, the right. And that's in John chapter 1 and verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We were born again. But I got to tell you, that's a spiritual birth, and it takes place exactly like the spiritual birth that Jesus had in this sense that it is done by the power of the Holy Spirit in us and what is created in us is a new creature old things are passed away all things have become new and so this man who had a human nature who is a spirit being but dead in sin and trespasses. That old man dies. And there is a new man created. Now, if that's true, as you look at me, how many persons are in here? One. How many persons were in Jesus? One. How many natures are in me? one how many natures are in jesus two why because he's the only begotten he's the only one that's been birthed and brought into this world in that unique fashion he is a one of a kind you and i are just human we are just creatures but we are wonderful creations of god and there is that New nature is created in us. The God on high comes to live in us, but we are not made God. We are only an abode. We are only a temple for the true God to live in. Jesus was not just a temple for God to live in. Jesus was God. There's a difference, okay? Now, how does that take place for us? That's why you need to keep on reading all the Bible. (laughs) 
and keep studying and knowing what everything says and put it together in some semblance of systematic theology. And I look at Romans 8. I'm telling you, if I ever have to do without the Bible and people ask me what one chapter do you want to have and keep forever in A and it's all I'll ever get, I want Romans chapter 8. You just go back so many times and you read stuff that is just, it's full. And I want to read verses 14, 15, 16, 17 to you that says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. So if you're led by the Spirit of God tonight, you are a son or a child of God. To as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, according to John, right? So you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. I got to tell you, begotten son like Jesus in John chapter 3 verse 16 is different from adopted son like Malcolm in Romans chapter 8 verse 14. I'm adopted. You are adopted. You are not like the only begotten. You can't be. You're not God. You got God living in you, but he's still God. You personally are a person of one nature, human nature, with the abode of Christ in you. But you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. What gives me the right to say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name? You know, Jesus never spoke about our Father, except in that one place. It was always my Father, my Father, my Father. And when you pray, you pray, Our Father. There's something different. There's a different relationship between Father and Son in the Godhead and Father and Son in a Christian. It's different And it comes about by adoption. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Without the Spirit of God living in you, you are not one of the children of God. But He bears witness to us. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. We're adopted. Adopted. Adopted people tell me that's even more special than being begotten because they were chosen and picked out and desired. (laughs) Jesus is equal with God. He is the son of David as fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is son of God and he's the only one like him. He's the only begotten. And he is son of man, telling us not just about his humanity and his deity, but he's telling us about his messianic fulfillment of Scripture. And he says you could be son as well, but it is by adoption. And a new creation is made. And we're different, but we're blessed you got to know that. We are blessed to be called the children of God. How God does all of that, I don't know. You know, people spend all of their lives trying to figure all this stuff out. I just know it's so because it's in the Bible. And I can say, Father, Abba. It's like saying Daddy. I don't know what you call your father, but I call my father Daddy. And when I say Daddy... I think sweet stuff. And he says, by the adoption, we can call God the Father because we've been adopted as sons. We can say, Daddy. Wow, that's great. So it matters who Jesus is, and it matters who you are in response to who he is. And that's why we study this stuff. It ought to make you love God more. Love the Father more and appreciate Jesus more. Jesus, unique, wonderful. And he shows us how to be a child of a father 
in a pleasing way. I always wanted to please my dad. I didn't think he was looking. That's when I got in trouble. I didn't think he'd find out. That's when I got in trouble. But if I thought he was going to find out, I was a pretty good kid. Because there was something on the inside of me that wanted to please my dad. There ought to be something on the inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit that makes us want to please our Heavenly Father. Abba, Father. Holy Spirit, help us to please the Father. God, will you help us as we come to this time of invitation to please you? I don't know what people need to do tonight, whether they need to do anything or not. It's up to you. And I'm glad it's up to you, Father. But we give them that opportunity just now. And Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to hearts and tell us what to do. That we might be pleasing to you and honor you and obey you. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for what he's done for us to make it possible for us as a creature to be a son or a child of God. Bless us as we walk through life with the remembrance of that. And may it touch our hearts and our actions. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. You sing. You come if God tells you to do something right now.